this conference yesterday, we said that one of the objectives that we had for this event was to create the potential for a lasting impact on our own university campus and in the broader community. Thus far, we've heard the intellectual and scientific perspective, and we've heard from industry and those whose work, who work to protect the environment. We now turn to the point in the program where we will address the go forward perspective. Namely, what action can be taken in our own communities to address the ethical and environmental issues at stake? In this final session, entitled Eating More Ethically at Princeton, we will hear from a representative group among us who are actively engaged in this process called change. They will give us a window on what is happening and what is possible in the university environment, in our own communities, and in the promise of the youth of this nation. We'll start our session with remarks by two individuals who are professionally engaged in institutional food management services. John Turan of Sustainable Food Systems and Stu Orifice of Princeton's own dining services. Following their remarks, we, they will be joined by a panel representing the movement towards change in local communities and on campus. Our first speaker is the president and founder, owner, and operator of Sustainable Food Systems, LLC, a consulting and technical services company whose mission it is to help organizations consider social, ecological, and delicious differences in their business through the way they think about food. John Turan is nationally recognized for his innovative leadership in a culinary career that has encompassed over 25 years in the food industry. John is the former executive chef for Aramark Corporation at Yale University, where his accomplishments included the original design, development, and implementation of the internationally recognized Yale Sustainable Food Project. Some of his recent works include collaboration with the Culinary Institute of America, Kaiser Permanente, and several public school systems, as well as the international work of the Sustainable Food Laboratories. Please join me in welcoming John Turan. Uh, thank you very much. And I also I want to thank Peter, Kathy, and the uh, Princeton Environmental Institute for putting on this wonderful, wonderful program today. Give them a hand. Listen, I, I want to apologize ahead of time if, you know, I, I start to sweat and my eyes get a, a little blurry and I, I start to get a little short of breath and my, my knees knock and the, and the shakes start. It's not because of stage fright. It's because it's Friday afternoon, late afternoon, and for more than 20 years in the business I was in, this was about the time our weekly numbers would come in. How did we do financially? How did we perform? Did we make a profit? Did we lose money? If we lost money, why did we lose money? How much did we lose? How were we going to make it up? What, what, were our, what was our plan for, for the next week and the following week? It was all about dollars. And if there's one constant I think I've seen throughout last night's presentation by Eric and, and Peter, and then all day today, I kept seeing this dollar sign. I just really kept seeing dollars. And when Peter asked me if I would speak here, and he said, would you talk about the cost impacts of sustainable food? I said, I would absolutely love to, because in my experience, there's been uh, an often misconception and a mis misunderstanding by the advocates who pro promote sustainable food in really understanding what those cost impacts were or have been. And also, those that are operating in food services sometimes may, don't understand what's possible. So what I, what I hope to do here is share my experiences with institutions, both institutions that I've worked with as, as an employee, and also that I've worked with since, that I've gone out to, to work with, so that I can help paint a, a little bit clearer picture. Um, I, I don't want to say that I'm speaking about Princeton University. I mean, that's what Stu can, can speak to. I'm just talking about the industry in general. Um, so here's what my focus is today. I hope to at least articulate the world of institutional food costs, uh, expenses, services, you know, what that's all about. And also then what the impact has been of putting sustainable food programs into that model. And then... I would be remiss if I didn't try to, in that process, share some strategies to, uh, to, uh, to hopefully be successful. So here's kind of, this is a lesson. Some of you guys may know this, some of you may not. But in the world of food service, we have to work with budgets. 
And it, it's broken down this way, and it's, this is rough, but for every dollar that's spent for, on the college food, in the college food service world, about 30 to 40 cents goes into the cost of the food. About four, anywhere between 40 and 50 goes into pay and cover staff labor, the insurance to pay and, and, and benefits for labor, total labor cost. And about 10 or 20 percent goes into other expenses, other costs. Some people call them direct expenses, and, and they cover anything from linen, laundry, paper supplies, general insurance. You know, there, there's, a, there's a whole another other world out there that, that covers that dime to 20 cents. If someone's lucky, they might have some money left over they could call a profit or that they could put into resources for a following year. Um, maybe. And I say that seriously, it's a tough world. It's nickels and dimes. So I have, I have two quarters in my hand. I have 50 cents. I won't even buy a cup of coffee. I won't buy much. As a matter of fact, it got me about an hour of, uh, maybe an hour, I, at the meters out here when I parked, when I parked today. So I used a lot, of these, uh, a lot of these quarters. But what does it mean in the food service world? Uh, think about an institution that may average about 6,000 meals a day. Now, uh, three, day, three meals a day, so you know, it comes out to total about 6,000 meals. So in your mind, frame that. That's average. I mean, there's a lot, a lot bigger than that, and there's many much smaller than that. Now, on average, on a college campus, there's about 220 days that you're going to be feeding. We've got to provide service. Right? That's six hundred and sixty thousand dollars. So that fifty cents turned into six hundred and sixty thousand dollars. What did that fifty cents mean? Well, I, I I brought it up to say that's a small amount of what the an increase might be for a cost per meal if if you start implementing a sustainable food program. The one thing I want to mention right from the get-go here, though, is that no two programs are ever going to be alike. Okay, that that I, I'm using generics here, but fiscal and, phys, and physical limitations are going to have an impact on, on an institution's decisions about going and, and changing to a sustainable food program. Uh, staff, staff level, staff skills, a lot, of, a lot of these are going to have, uh, and geographic location to what's local, uh, you know, a lot of these are going to have an impact. So realize that, that pennies of a difference add up to a whole lot of money. So if there's, a, there's another message to try to get across to everybody, it's that I think the power and the decisions and the influence of an institution shifting to a sustainable food program rests in people beyond the food service operators. These guys, you know, and people like I did sweat every Friday afternoon or, or more often, you know, there's a lot of stress and pressure. They're reporting to people high up, whether it's a food service company, whether it's their self-op. They've got fiscal responsibilities. So movers and shakers, I call them. These are folks high up ranking levels at the university need to buy in and be committed to invest that kind of money, and that kind of money is only an example. It might be more, it might be less. I just tried to frame that a little bit for you. Here's the other thing about conventional food service. In my opinion, and I'm, I'm just as guilty about this as, as probably anybody else. For, you know, I worked that business for a long, long time. I think we've created our own monster because, believe it or not, there were times that the customers actually complained about the food. I swear to God, I know it's hard to believe, it's hard to understand, but, you know, there were times a customer had a complaint. What was the reaction? What was my reaction? My reaction was to keep adding, adding, add quantity, add, you know, add more choices, more options, more sizes, more portion sizes, more, 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 you know, concepts, concepts, concepts. And it's become an issue of quantity and convenience over quality and sustenance. And it's, it's that model that we've put ourselves into. Now, if you think this morning, think back to Marion's presentation, those of you guys that saw it, there was that picture of a box that had uh, like the, the breakfast 
You know, you get a breakfast at a moment's notice. What did it say in there? Save labor. So that's, that's been the mantra in institutional food service for a long time, too. Maybe not save labor, or probably save labor, but at least don't increase labor. So we've had the, the, the mission to add all these choices and all these options. We've never had the leverage or the leeway to say increase your labor accordingly. Well, guess what? When you're asked to serve a lot more variety, a lot more choices, how do you do it without increasing labor? You start having to buy processed food, value-added food, food that doesn't take as much time to handle and prepare. So that's kind of the model that, that the, the industry in general has kind of put itself into. So what happens when you try to shift that model into a sustainable food program? Food costs. Okay, I talked about food, labor, and direct. What is the impact on the food costs? Well, I don't have a number to throw at you. I can't tell you because, it, like I said, it, it's going to vary. But one of the things I would ask or, or, or need to explain is what part of the menu are you going to change? Are you going to plug and play? Are you just going to take zucchini that might happen to be on the menu uh, you know, off and put in a local zucchini? Well, that might be great. You're supporting a local farm with local zucchini, but what are you getting out of that? What are you gaining? Out of what, you know, what is your customer going to really know about the fact that at that, or you're going, to, you're going to be minimizing, you know, your opportunity, your, your plugging and, and plug and play, I call it, versus a bigger, broader scale. But when you think broader scale, you start to think again, see those dollar signs. The other thing I want to mention, too, is that it's very hard to say you're going to change every single ingredient and every single recipe on every menu to sustainable. It's not going to happen. You know, it's just, it's going to be, it's nearly impossible unless you're really, really committed and you happen to live in a phenomenal, I guess, agricultural area. But, you know, some of the basics, you know, like groceries and things like that, you may, you may be using conventional models. So the bottom line, I guess what I'm saying, is that the cost impact to food ends up being a percentage of a percentage. The percent, so 30, per, let's use 35 cents, I said it costs out of every dollar for food. So that's where your primary increase is going to happen is in the food cost. And it's only a part of that percentage that's going to go up. So when people ask me, mostly the advocates, again, not the folks that are really plugged into the food services, but they say, oh, I heard it's going to go up 50 percent. I know our food budget is $8 million. That means it's going to go up to $12 million. No. You know, if, you, if you're really only increasing the cost of food, it's a percentage of a percentage. So I hope that's kind of I've made that clear a little bit. I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think I need to go into too much detail with this audience that the true cost of hidden food, you know, uh, that, that it should cost more. Um, we've talked today about the environmental impact of cheap food. I put this on here to say that, you know, it, we need to leverage this information to those movers and shakers that need to understand why we would commit hundreds of thousands of dollars, if that's what we want to commit, or less, or more, to change. What's the benefit? Well, my God, we talked about all the environmental impact today. You know, ec ec economic impact, I once read uh, recently by the USDA History of Agriculture that right after World War II, our population is, in this country was 130 million people. And we had over 6 million farms providing the food for 130 million people. Now, you know what that is today, that number? The population number is doubled. It's 260 plus million people. So what's happened to the farms? Well, logically, right, we must have a lot more farms. No, well, have they stayed the same? No, it's shrunk to a third. There's only two million farms supplying the food for twice as many people. Economically, does that make sense? Who's supplying our food? Who's making our food decisions? We've heard a lot of that today. And in a nutritional impact, you know, the millions of statistics or the, the lots of statistics I've heard, the one that, that really hits home to me the most as a father of a couple of young kids is that the next, the next generation of children is actually going to be the first in the history of this country to not live as long as its parents. Boy, that's progress, huh? My God. So... You know, these are the issues of the true cost of cheap food. It's got to be sold. It's got to be convinced. 
So, here's a strategy for you. Less is more when it comes to food costs. You want, you, you want to make an impact, you really want to start putting a lot more items on your menu, a lot more sustainable items, you've got to go focus more on quality and less on quantity. That menu that I talked about that's all about options and choices and variety and size, you've got to throw it out. You've got to be courageous enough to throw it out as a food service provider, as an as a administrator, and as a customer, as a student. You know, are you courageous enough to throw that menu out and go back to just several delicious, phenomenal, locally produced, in-season, wonderful dishes prepared by hand, by scratch, that taste absolutely delicious? Trade-off? I think, I think it's a no-brainer. So it, the, the, the result is you're spending the same amount of time or people, theoretically, producing less food, but you're going to have more resources, hands to work with that food. So it makes sense, you know, you've got, you've got, you can produce, you can handle that food that needs more nurturing, more, more control for a higher quality product. So what's the impact on labor costs if we're not careful? Threshold products, they take longer to handle. They, 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 it, somebody needs to stand there and work with them and, and start peeling and chopping. And when we put the program in at Berkeley Dining Hall at Yale, I remember the staff used to welcome people into the kitchen and say, welcome to Berkeley, chop, 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 you know, start chopping, start chopping, everything was about chop, chop, chop. So there is, it's handwork. And I, I explained, staff these days aren't handling a lot of food service. People have lost that touch. They're opening, heating, serving in conventional food service models. If you start taking that less is more model that I mentioned in a menu, you're going to start economizing your steps though. So instead of that staff having to handle 35 items on a menu, maybe you get them to handle 10 or 12. So you're economizing the amount of steps involved. Be aware of culinary skills and culinary skill levels. A lot, think about it, that, that change to a, to a heat and serve or, or, you know, that might be the extreme, but the less processed food has really resulted in, in in, in a lack of skill. People have lost that skill level. And when you start saying, okay, here's a case of butternut squash, <laughs> do something with it. I still have the scars and the dents on my head, I think, you know, when people start throwing them at me. What do you want me to do with this? But you want me to do what? <laughs> so, and, and, and in some cases, it wasn't skills. It was just saying, you know, okay, you got to start doing something you haven't done in quite a few years. So you've got to, you've got to need to, to invest in training. And, and, and in that training falls into two categories. Technical training, I call it the how. You know, how are you, how are you gonna handle that butternut squash? How are you gonna write a menu? How, what kind of, how are you gonna create recipes? Um, you know, how are you gonna chop a whole bunch of garlic from whole bulbs, you know, quickly because of the volume we're doing? The other part, which is as important in my mind, or is more important, is teaching training staff why you're doing this. Why are we undertaking this, going down this road? Because let's face it, I don't know how many folks have either been a trainer or a trainee and somebody comes in and just tells you what to do and walks away. If you're not sold in your heart about what you're doing, it's gonna be awfully hard to carry that on or your trainee isn't sold in their heart. Not, the odds of carrying that on. So people have gotta be connected to the food, the stories behind the food, where food comes from, staff is, and they're gonna embrace that. It's gonna, it's gonna really encourage those creative juices and the reasons they're in this business in the first place. So th those are some of the surprise benefits to that, that, that part. Is staff morale actually can increase. After it might, might get a little antsy about you want me to do what, once, it, once through, pro through some nurturing and time and, and process, they get pretty psyched. That, you know, hey, well, I'm a chef again. I'm actually, this is what got me into the business in the first place. You know, and, and, you know, the health issues, well, they're gonna, if they're gonna translate to the customers, I think chances are they're gonna translate to your staff as well. These are, I mean, other cost impacts. I talked about the two big ones, food and labor. Other costs, uh, infrastructure. People, a lot of people ask, okay, oh my God, we've gotta, we've gotta renovate our facilities, no way. No need to renovate. 
I've never, I, I mean, that would be absolutely wonderful if you had that opportunity. I've never experienced it. You know, you can work within what you have. Build a menu around your existing capabilities. If you don't have a lot of freezer space, actually, you don't need a lot of freezer space with this type of food. But if you don't have a lot of, say, refrigeration space or staffing levels, don't overdo it. Build a menu within your, your, your uh, capabilities. I was talking with Gary Gyberson yesterday about waste removal benefits to this. Gary's at Lawrenceville, and he told me about this. I mean, we all know about composting, I think, you know, and the benefits of saving our kitchen scraps and turning that back into nurturing soil and the benefits of that. Well, guess what? We pay to have trash removed from our kitchens. We pay by the ton. We pay, it's called a tippage fee, that every time the dumpsters are emptied. If we can start reducing the amount of trash and waste that goes out because now it's going back into the soil, Wow, we're, you know, we're, we're not only are we helping the environment in multiple ways, we're saving money. And he was telling me about this program at Rutgers where they're now even taking some of these scraps and put it into, trying to put them into, a, uh, into, into a, a fuel source or a source of energy. So it's like uh, we're on the cusp of something really cool here. Equipment costs, there's a lot of ways to let the equipment do the handwork. You know, there's, there, there's some modest investments. It's going to save time. It's going to save wasted food. So there are, there are definite strategies that are a way to get over the hump and the anxieties of dealing with fresh whole food. Marketing and merchandising. I, I, it's so critical. People ask me, you know, at Yale or, or at a few other places now that I've been, been fortunate enough to be with, you know, what about while you were building up to it? I mean, how did you get students to know what was coming? And I said, well, there was, a lot, there was a lot of attention given to really publicizing what we were going to be doing and why we were going to be doing it. Then when you're doing it, shout it from the rooftops. You know, make, make classic great menus like we've seen, we saw today at lunch and last night at, at dinner. You know, great looking menus that, that talked about the simplicity of the food and, and the story behind it, where it came from. Do that every day. Do it every meal. You know, let your customers plug into what, what's the story behind that food. Other costs. Uh, invest in resources. Tap into experts or people or institutions that have already been doing this. Uh, partner with local resources. NOFA, uh, New Jersey NOFA, um, or, you know, other, other departments of ags that, are gonna, that have started to lay the groundwork for this. And I say, for goodness sake, as well as your clientele, you do it right. I, when, when we were putting the program in at Yale, I had the fortune of working with Alice Waters, and if I heard it once, I heard it a thousand times to the point where I, I, at first I was getting somewhat insulted by it until I realized, you know, she meant it, and now I understand why. If you're going to do this, and you're going to make a commitment, you're going to commit money, resources, time, blood, sweat, tears, and all this, you better do it right because your customers are out there waiting. And you could spend all the time and all the money and, and effort on getting wonderful ingredients. And if you continue, if, if God forbid you're practicing some pretty sloppy ways of producing food and you're handling this food the same way or in the same manner or the same type of menu, People are going to say, what's the big deal? So you got to really do your homework and do it right. Do it right. So in summary, I said no two programs are alike. I can't sit here and say costs are going to go up, bleep, bleep, bleep. It's going to, it's, it, it factors on all those other things that I talked about. It's going to depend on the level of commitment. Commitment from high level, in a couple of ways, high level, low level, uh, service staff. Also, how much of your menu are you going to commit to? Invest in the right resources and, equip and equipment. Don't cut corners. You'll pay for it in the long run. It's an opportunity for saving costs, waste removal, disposables. You know, you actually can save money. There's one school that I'm working with right now, and we're actually, we put in a phenomenal local sustainable food program, and we're saving them money because of a lot of the, the, the things they were doing. We were just doing incorrectly. Increase your sales. The demand is there. I mean, I know I'm talking about dollars, and, and here I am being a little contradictory about that almighty dollar, but you know what it is? It is about dollars, but you, it's actually going to drive sales for you. It's going to increase staff morale. 
You're supporting the local economy. And beyond anything else, you're gonna, you'll reward yourself beyond any expectations you ever, ever imagine. So I, I don't sweat anymore on Friday afternoons. Um, I, 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 I now check what I need to do and uh, reassess my values, and now I take my values to work with me, and I don't, I don't sweat anymore. So I wish you well, and thank you very much. Thank you, John. Our next speaker needs no introduction on the Princeton campus. Stuart Orifis is the Director of Dining Services here at Princeton University. He's a graduate of the School of Hotel and Food Administration at Cornell University. In his current position at, at Princeton, Stuart's responsible for a department with 18 operations and over 500 employees. Under Stu's leadership, the dining team at Princeton has developed several ongoing initiatives as a result of working with students, including Green Princeton, that shift purchases towards foods produced with lower environmental impacts, reduce dining hall waste, and, stronger, and create stronger ties with the local community. These initiatives include recycling food waste with a lo local pig farmer, purchasing Jersey Fresh local produce, a partnership with small rural roasters, and providing ocean-friendly seafood as evidenced by a partnership with the Monterey Bay Aquarium in the, sea, in the sea, part of its Seafood Watch program. He and his staff have worked tirelessly, enthusiastically in support of this conference. Please welcome Stuart. Thank you, Kathy, and uh, thank you, Peter, and the PEI group for allowing us to be a part of this uh, wonderful uh, two-day experience. Uh, and I'd also like to thank John. And John, can you join me at my next budget meeting with my boss? I think that would be extremely helpful. Uh, and also thanks to your former Yale colleagues for allowing us to have a uh, bonfire tonight. We appreciate that as well. <laughs> Those were the cage-free tigers uh, last weekend. But... And I would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, some folks on the panel, uh, as you probably heard and know that uh, we work very closely with the Greening Princeton Group. And I'd like to thank uh, Katie and Nathan uh, for their assistance uh, moving our program forward. I guess I should thank Bill because without Bill we wouldn't have Katie, so. And Aneem, I must thank you for dealing with all the Princeton graduates and uh, dealing with the Princeton students, so enough thank yous. Let's move on to the program. What's on our plate here at Princeton? Uh, we have several things on our plate. Our plate is fairly full, uh, as you probably heard, but there's always room for a little bit more. Our program started in 2002, about the time that Alice Waters' daughter was going through orientation at Yale. Uh, we started a program here at Princeton, and it was largely uh, due to the predecessors of Nathan and, and Katie uh, talking about what can we do at Princeton to have something a little bit uh, more than what we have today in the world of sustainability. And the program started fall of 2002. Uh, we scheduled lunch meetings. We met every Friday for an entire year with our students. We created the priorities. Uh, we brought industry leaders in to provide presentations to us, guest lecturers. Uh, we actually had a campus survey uh, to see what the students and faculty and staff felt about the issue of sustainability and local foods. Uh, it really was a partnership, and a partnership that exists today. And you can see that I have the Greening Princeton logo on this slide because they are a huge part of, of our success. Prior to 2002, uh, we actually had a few modest enhancements. We, uh, as uh, Kathy mentioned, we have a pig farming program which started in 1994. All of our food waste uh, is picked up by a local pig farmer here in New Jersey, uh, except for the food at the Center for Jewish Life for obvious reasons. The, uh, we also have, uh, we had a recycled napkin program and uh, we started our first web survey back in 1994. Uh, it was called the Web Surf and Turf Program. So we talked about priorities. Uh, when we met with the students, what were the priorities? And uh, clearly, uh, the campus mug program was a priority. And one of the things that we found was that our current mug program, we offered discounts for not using uh, paper cups, was not very successful. And some of the students said, because you guys designed the mug. Let, let students design the mug. And lo and behold, students designed the mug. And we probably doubled or tripled some of the, uh, uh, the uses uh, of the mug uh, on, our, on our campus. 
We talked about the differences and the benefits of organic versus local to tr uh, talk about priorities. Uh, our ocean-friendly seafood program. Uh, we talked about dairy products and how we can get organic milk into the dining halls. Uh, we had several discussions about antibiotic-free, uh, hormone-free meats, grass-fed, free-range, the gamut. Uh, those priorities shifted as we met every week. Uh, and disposable products were also on our list. Organic and local foods. Now, clearly we've heard uh, for the last day and a half that there, the issue between uh, organic and local. How are we going to wrestle with that here at Princeton? Well, some of the things that we talked about were cereal, uh, produce, uh, coffee, and uh, also how are we going to market all of the changes that we, that we have. And my apologies to Bob, but Bob, we don't serve fast food. We serve good food fast at Princeton. <laughs> And that was one of our guiding philosophies. We also have a very healthy campus here. Uh, one of the items that uh, we researched last year was that in our food court, the food gallery at Frist, we serve more salads combined than we do all fried food items combined. When you think about that, that's a pretty healthy community. Uh, we have French fries, we have onion rings, we offer chicken, um, fried chicken, chicken fingers, and while they may be popular, our salads are more popular. So in general, we have a very healthy community. Cereal was one of the first things that we addressed with the students. Uh, I was fortunate to be a member of the General Mills Advisory Board, and we were able to have a test site here for their Cascadian Farms products. Uh, we tested the products. There were four products that were brought onto campus because they were in retail boxes. That's not very convenient for a college food service operator. We needed bulk bags, a lot of the dispensers that you see in the all-you-care-to-eat operations. So we tested four products, we had surveys, and the Princeton students selected their two top favorites out of the four. For some strange reason, those are not the two that General Mills selected to package in bulk. <laughs> Maybe we're just a little smarter than the average uh, community. Uh, but they did package two in bulk, and we created a standard that we would have two cereals in every dining hall that would be organic. Uh, we also sourced uh, from a local vendor, Pear Tree, uh, some of our granola, uh, which was also organic. Our plans for the future include taking our granola and actually making it on campus, similar to what Yale does, so that we can have organic granola in all of our operations made here on our own campus. Local versus organic produce. Well, we're very fortunate here in New Jersey to have a Jersey Fresh program. If that logo is a little fuzzy, it's because I just don't know how to do PowerPoint that well. Uh, but it's also because it might have been a fuzzy peach day for us. But we're very fortunate that we have the Jersey Fresh program, and it allowed us to uh, provide a, a wide range of, of produce and products that we have within the state of New Jersey. When we're dealing with produce, we know some of the issues. We had seasonal availability. Uh, the produce in New Jersey is terrific when the students are not here. We had to deal with all the vendors. Um, how many vendors are willing to deliver to our campus? Uh, quality. Well, some of the local produce is great on some days, and then it's not terrific on other days, depending on the climate. And whether or not we should actually look at some of the organic local products versus just the, the non-organic or those that are being raised in, or, in an organic way. So we were fortunate we have a local connection. Uh, with, with the Jersey Fresh products, we met uh, a fellow named Bob Garino. And he said, because we had called several of the farmers in, in, the, in, in the local area, and we asked them if they would participate in a program here at Princeton. And a lot of them said, you'll take all of my produce. There's nothing I can do. So what we did is we partnered with Bob Garino. Bob said, I'll pick up from all the farmers in New Jersey. And uh, what, what he did was, he said, you know, I can do this on a, on a, on a uh, I guess, a, a basis that, you know, on an experimental basis, and we'll see how it goes from that point. The difficulty we had was Bob said, I can only drop at one of your buildings. Well, you heard we have 18 operations, we have 10 locations. That was a challenge. So now we had to drop it off at one of our dining halls and then take our truck and move it around to all the other dining halls. But we were committed, and it took a little bit more labor on our end, but it was important to make sure that we, that we supported the local produce, and it was better. Our weekly bids now, what we do for our produce bids is we ask our vendors to bid organic, bid Jersey Fresh, and bid conventional. That's something new for our purchasing department. We all had to learn new things when we had to move into this area. Coffee. Coffee was an easy one for us. We still haven't found the local coffee bean in New Jersey, but we're looking. 
in our retail cafes, we partnered with Small World Roasters. You may have sampled some of the coffee today. Uh, in our colleges and in our food gallery, uh, we have a product from a company called Paul de Lima out of Syracuse. The question that, we, that we're often asked is, is it fair trade? And uh, in certain cases, uh, the, the roasters at Small World will say that it's not necessarily stamp fair trade because a lot of the farmers will not pay for that certification. But it's socially responsible. If you look at the title of this slide, I keep adding a slash every year. It started with fair trade, then it was fair trade organic, then it was fair trade shade grown, and now it's fair trade organic shade grown bird friendly coffee. <laughs> and that's all thanks to Katie. We had to do a financial analysis clearly when we moved these products into our, uh, into our operations. Equipment is a key for a lot of the small vendors. Will they pay for your grinders? And you work out a partnership agreement uh, that's mutual, mutually beneficial for everyone. Marketing is also very important, letting our students know that we are serving these, these uh, coffees on our campus and making sure that partnership is a long-standing vendor partnership. The nice thing is with the Greening Princeton students is they are a mouthpiece. They told the students we switched to fair trade before I had a chance to, which is a tremendous advantage when you're working together. One thing we also learned about marketing in general is that we have managers that their focus is on the food and making sure that the food is prepared correctly and it's on the line, the coffee is in its place. But when it comes to making sure they put the organic sign or the local sign next to the product, well, let's say sometimes they're a little forgetful. So we found was that the web is the best place to put most of our products. It's not that we don't put it in the, in the uh, dining halls or at the point of sale, but we found that the website is a, is a very uh, easy tool for all of our customers to log on and say, what is Jersey Fresh this week and what is local this week? And if you log on to our website, you will see all those items, what's organic and what's Jersey Fresh, what's local. Uh, photos also tell the story, and it's very important that um, you know, we have photos available uh, for our students so they know where some of the products came from. Uh, the photo you saw before was a photo we took at Russo's Farm with our Greening Princeton students. Then we had to talk about chicken and eggs. Uh, which came first? They came at the same time. When our students met with us, it was important that we explored the cage-free egg issue and that we explored the antibiotic-free and hormone-free uh, and, um, and free-to-roam or free-range chickens. And I'm also told from the students that the reason the chicken crossed the road was because he was cage-free. And we put this little guy on the slide because one of the students put that in for me and he just likes it, figuring that I would bore you all at this point because this might wake you up. Uh, but our chicken priorities were that uh, we were focusing on antibiotic-free chicken uh, and then moved to a free-to-roam and free-range chicken. So we, that was a, a daunting task, uh, talking to all our manufacturers and researching all the chicken products that we receive and, and ensuring that uh, we make some important uh, progress on this front. A majority of our chicken today is antibiotic free uh, that we're purchasing and we have plans for the future on the, the free to roam chicken. When we looked at uh, the vendors that we were using and the manufacturers, we actually had to bring an intern in uh, to go through all the different chicken um, products that we were purchasing. To get policy statements from some of these vendors and some of the manufacturers um, getting one through Tyson, it was very interesting because I was part of a Tyson advisory board where on their website they had one statement and when I went to the meeting they had a second statement. So I had to sit down with them and say, where are you with antibiotic free? Sometimes you have to dig and you have to work a little hard to make sure that you get the right answer from some of the manufacturers. Packing was also an issue. Uh, some of the bulk packing uh, wasn't available at the time and it was very difficult for our staff to open up individual uh, chicken breasts for some of the uh, some of the operations. When it came to eggs, I think uh, we all know where we are today, based on the previous presentation. And uh, you know, we struggled with uh, with eggs a little bit because of the pricing uh, of cage-free uh, versus uh, conventional. Um, but the important thing for the students was that they were local eggs. So when we weren't purchasing cage-free shell eggs, at least they were local. Um, the or and. The preference was that, you know, can we have, you know, the, the, the chickens with an organic feed in addition to being cage-free, and we're like, one step at a time, please. Um, but we're working on it. Liquid eggs right now, the market hasn't shifted to that. 
point where we can afford that. That's a, definitely a cost issue for us, uh, but we know that the manufacturers are working hard on making sure that liquid eggs, uh, that the gap is closing when it comes to the increase in cost. You heard about our seafood program, our ocean-friendly seafood program. Uh, it was important that we chose the right guide. We decided to go with Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, we are a partner uh, with them. The cost implications, that was a cost-neutral program. If it wasn't uh, a, a, an ocean-friendly seafood product, it wasn't on our menu. That was easy for us, uh, and the customer acceptance was very good. And I hope you all take one of the little guides with you, because part of our partnership agreement is that we have to distribute several thousand of these cards throughout the year. So please take one or two. Uh, part of the marketing was a poster that we put in the dining halls to let folks know because we started putting the red, green, and yellow dots on our, on our food tags, and they were saying, what's up with the dots? And my understanding is we spell this wrong, what's up is supposed to be one word, uh, but uh, this was a very effective tool. And some of our guiding principles, uh, we, I've been asked, well, how do you make these changes and make some of these decisions? And it really comes down to acronyms, because we're known for acronyms here at Princeton. Uh, so the acronym is CASH. Uh, is there consumer demand? It has to be all about taste. We have to share that cost, and how far did it travel? And those are the four elements that we look at when we're trying to decide between moving to a different product. Uh, you could apply the cage-free egg scenario to that. A good example was when we had some funding left, uh, we looked at organic bread and how we're going to have one organic bread in every dining hall. So we, the problem was some of the organic breads didn't taste very good. So enter Greening Princeton, we sit down, have a lunch, and we cut up a lot of bread. And a lot of the bread wasn't very good, um, but we eventually selected a bread that would work, and, uh, and that was uh, a very popular decision with the students. So where are we going next? Uh, this is on our list for the future, uh, thanks to our Greening Princeton students. Uh, we're looking at non-food items, cleaning products. We have a, a Green Seal certified floor cleaner in all of our dining halls at this point, but we need to do more. Uh, disposable plates and utensils. We have a corn-based plastic cup in our food, food court uh, for our fruit and our parfaits, but that's, there, there's more out there that we can do. We're looking at earth-friendly entrees. Uh, the working title right now is E-squared uh, because we're the home of Einstein. And we're looking at something where we can put an identifier on all of our entrees to say that this is an earth-friendly entree. What's the definition of that? What's the criteria? That's what we're going to work out with our students. We'll sit down together and figure out what is, what is earth-friendly, what is sustainable, how much of the percentage of the food uh, or the ingredients in the product will, be, uh, will make it earth-friendly. There's a farmer's market that we're working on for the spring for the center of campus. Uh, together with Greening Princeton. Right now we have a biodiesel project. It's in a pilot stage. We have uh, one person picking up the oil from two of our dining halls, uh, so it's being converted into a, uh, for their particular vehicle that they're, they're riding in town. We're looking at fair trade cocoa. We have bids out uh, for that, switching uh, our cocoa over to a fair trade product. And we're also looking at more education. We've heard it before that uh, that's the most important uh, element of our program is making sure that our students and our faculty and staff are educated on this subject. If there's consumer demand, we will make those decisions and hopefully make the right decisions. And uh, after this conference, we hope to get some more feedback from our Greening Princeton students. And it's interesting that, you know, our, I said our plate is full and there's always room for a little more. I'm not sure what side of the plate we're on, but I think we'll, we'll move something over to make sure we have room. But I came from the Ivy Dining Conference uh, on Monday and Tuesday, and actually two of our colleagues are here in the audience, uh, Jessica from Harvard and uh, Coogan, I think, is still here from Columbia. And, uh, you know, I joke that, you know, I've been in food service 24 years, and I could see a decade from now students coming into my office saying, Stu, why do we have to have so much local food? Can't we have something from California? Well, I look forward to that day um, because it'll be a fun day to talk about where we were. Thank you for your time. We're now going to turn to the panel portion of the program, and um, I'm just going to briefly um, uh, introduce the um, four members, additional members of the panel, and then they're going to tell you a little bit about themselves and their particular interests and, and passions. Um, Bill Anderson, going from right to left, Bill Anderson, class of 81 at Princeton. Bill has a commitment to local and sustainable farming on the local level in his local community. Katie Anderson, class of 08 
and Nathan Gregory, who's a graduate student here at Princeton, have been very active, as you've heard, in greeting Princeton. And Anim Steele is involved in a very interesting um, project up in um, Boston, uh, the Food Project. So, um, Bill, let me start with you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here today. It's exciting to see all this interest in food issues. When I was here, um, food was not an issue except to complain about the low quality of the dining halls. And it was great to, uh, we had a meal last night that Stu's group fixed and it was spectacular. So uh, it's great to see a person headed in this direction. At that meal, I think I, what I saw what must, must be Katie's highlights so far at Princeton. Katie's a uh, uh, food and farming fanatic. And I looked over my shoulder, and there she was sitting between the Brad Pitt and George Clooney of the food world. <laughs> Michael Pollan and Eric Slosher, so <laughs> it has to have been a highlight for her, her uh, college career. Um, I work in two worlds. I, I develop strip shopping centers outside Philadelphia, which is definitely the national food system. And my wife and I also have an organic farm. We have a pasture livestock operation in the startup phase and an organic vegetable operation. I'll sit closer. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Let's say we, we have I've involved two businesses that develop uh, supermarket anchor shopping centers in suburban Philadelphia, and we have an organic uh, farming operation with a pasture livestock uh, operation startup phase, and we have an organic vegetable operation that's been going for a while. So I want to speak very briefly about uh, what I've seen in uh, working those two worlds and uh, what that might mean for uh, Princeton and how it can become more active in, in food issues. Um, I got involved in farming in the early 70s. My grandfather had a farm outside Philadelphia. And in high school, I started a business there growing sweet corn, which I wholesale in Wilmington. And in retrospect, what um, it's interesting about it was how easy it was to get into that business and how profitable it was. Uh, there was a, a um, local food system um, that consisted of small local supermarkets in the Wilmington area, which were happy to buy the local produce that I, that I grew. And uh, it made for uh, um, very low uh, barriers to entering the market, very easy to get into. Um, after I uh, continued that business through four years at Princeton, then I went to business school and got into the development business. And that moved me into the national food system. What I saw, uh, seen over the last uh, 20 years of developing shopping centers, is uh, the local food systems, at least in our area, be swallowed up by this national food system. And the evolution of these supermarkets which previously would buy local produce uh, into much larger, more regional operations or national operations, which um, by their very nature are not uh, set up for the local food system. They buy regionally, they buy on huge scale, they focus on shipability and shelf life and all these things which uh, with our little organic farm we really don't care about. We're just interested in providing uh, really high quality food. So. The effect of that has been to uh, really create substantial market barriers for uh, local farmers. This national food system, which you see everywhere in the form of strip shopping center, really exists now to help major national firms distribute. So if you're Hormel, Kraft, General Foods, or Coke, you have a distribution system which allows you to sell all over the country. But uh, five years ago in Phoenixville, if you wanted to buy uh, an ear of corn locally produced, it was much more difficult to do that than to buy an ear of corn from uh, California. That would be a week old, and, uh, far uh, inferior product. So um, in 2001, my wife and I, uh, well, it's been a big family project, Katie, the kids, my brother, parents, everybody's been involved. Uh, we opened uh, this organic vegetable farm, Charlestown Farm. We're 22 miles as crow flies from Center City, Philadelphia. So it's close in suburban area. We're close to millions of people. It's the fifth largest city in the country. But the first issue we had to deal with was how do we sell our product? There's no network of, there's no local food system. We're a very rudimentary local food system at best. So one of the big challenges was, despite the fact there are millions of people in a fairly small radius of this farm, we had to figure out how to sell our, our product. So we did two things. Uh, we set up a grower's market in Phoenixville, uh, which required um, help from the Food Trust, the Cleneal Foundation, Philadelphia Foundation. We probably got grants from 10 different foundations to promote this and make this work in what was a pretty desolate downtown uh, area in Phoenixville, the town that we live in. 
We also set up a CSA, Community Supportive Farm. And um, we're really recreating the food system, which must have existed there 25 years ago when there were local supermarkets, which would buy your goods. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's the Yale thing. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. So um, uh, five years into this, uh, both these operations are big success. Uh, the um, uh, growers market has been rated best of Philly. Um, we have uh, 15 vendors there on average weekend, maybe 1,000 shoppers. It's just been an enormous success, far exceeded what we had anticipated. The CSA has 160 families and a lengthy waiting list. And uh, there are a few lessons that come out of this. One, um, there is a huge demand for high-quality local food, um, huge demand. We're just thrilled by the number of numbers of people that are interested in, in, in what we have. Uh, the second thing is that this, um, uh, these local food systems make the community better. I think if you interviewed people in, in our area, they would all tell you that, um, that uh, Phoenixville is better for having this farmer's market, which has become the place to be on Saturday mornings, and our township of Charlestown is better with the CSA. So local food definitely helps the community. Third thing that's clear is that local food systems have largely gone away. And I like the national food system where there's a tremendous profit motive that causes these shopping centers to go up all over the place, far in excess of the real need for them. Uh, that profit motive doesn't exist with uh, local food systems. I developed a shopping center in Phoenixville. That, that, was, that was profitable. Uh, my wife and I have developed this uh, farmer's market in Phoenixville. That was emotionally rewarding, but not profitable. So I think that in order for... Uh, these local food systems to get going, you really have to look to organizations in the nonprofit sector to make them happen. And that's really where I would see Princeton playing a huge role in the local food systems. Uh, Princeton has potential to be a major benevolent force in the food world. And what you see, I see from my work in shopping centers, consumers see, is there are all sorts of malevolent forces in the food world. Princeton could be a major benevolent force and really do some great things. It should really support a farmer's market in Princeton. It should go further to um, uh, buy local foods. I think if it can do that, it can send students out into the world who will uh, understand the importance of local foods and food systems and uh, spread that kind of war across the country. What we've seen happen around us is much the same as what's happened in, the, uh, in textile manufacturing. You've seen food production shift to low-cost areas. And uh, clearly that has some negative uh, effects on manufacturing areas. But if you let the same thing happen in the food system, food systems, local food systems, I think you're going to see, uh, well, you already do see some negative effects. And I think that with the small efforts we made in our area, we made our community better. I think if Princeton can work to encourage its students to do more things by setting a model here, it would be great. So thank you. Hi, um, so my name is Katie Anderson, and I'm a junior here at Princeton, and I could not be more thrilled that this conference is happening and more thankful for it. Um, I just had some really short comments before the panel begins, because I think the question and answer sessions are what are really helpful for everyone here today. Um, so I'm the president of Greening Princeton on campus. Um, basically, we're an, an environmental student organization, and our mission has always been to work really closely with uh, Princeton University administrators like Stu and like some of the other people here today. Um, so our recent projects have included uh, our work with Stu and Dining Services. Um, we were especially proud of the Sustainable Seafood Project. Um, and as Becky Goldberg talked today, uh, is, seafood is a huge issue right now in the food chain. Um, we also had a campaign for Princeton to hire a sustainability manager, Shauna Weber, who has been an unbelievable pre presence on campus since she arrived in June. Uh, we also campaigned and created and are coordinating a student-initiated seminar on campus uh, led by Thomas Kreutz, in which 20 students are examining Princeton's carbon emissions and are creating a report to suggest an ethical, uh, an ethical emissions tra trajectory for the university. Um, basically, we found that we do best by responding to students' concerns on campus. Uh, and right now, as you can see, there's a growing interest in food, um, especially with this conference. Uh, so our question has been, uh, what, what can we do about it? How can we respond and help students like, like our mem own members? Um, one answer is by far education. 
food and especially gastronomy has been a topic of current classes and seminars on campus. Um, Professor Frasica is here and Professor Marin and a couple other professors have taught a couple courses. Um, but there's not really one class that examines the route food goes from agriculture to the plate and its uh, time of con eventual consumption. And as Wendell Berry puts it, and I always, this is always in my head, eating is an agricultural act. And the agriculture part is often left out. Um, so using this conference as a starting point, we're organizing a food seminar to be taught next semester by Professor Deborah Popper, who's here tonight. And um, incidentally, the title is called Farm to Fork, the State of America's Food System Today. Although after listening to Mr. Langert's talk, I might change the title. <laughs> Considering, um, it's still in the planning stages and we would love any input from anyone in the crowd. Uh, the basic format of the course will feature a different speaker each week. Hopefully some people here today, we would be completely thrilled, the Brad Pitts and the George Clooney's. Um, but it will have a substantial reading list, including some um, works published by the people here today and uh, several field trips to area farms, producers, and restaurants. Um, we're basically trying to look at the, the different routes uh, food travels from farm to fork. Uh, and this is just one example of what students can do um, around the country. I think that there are uh, tons of universities that we should really be uh, following their example. Uh, Yale or Sinus, I think Columbia and Rutgers, I saw here today, and even Lawrenceville, our, our local uh, uh, private school, would be great to follow. So basically, we can learn a lot from everyone here, and I would love to do so. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Nathan Gregory, and I'm a uh, PhD candidate in ecology and evolutionary biology. Um, I'm also a fellow in the Princeton Environmental Institute Science, Technology, Environmental Policy Program. And I've been a member, was kind of leader, organizer of uh, Greening Princeton for about four years. Uh, I kind of build on, on what Katie's saying. I think one of our fundamental principles, and the thing I think I'm most proud of being part of the, the organization, is that it's really always been about kind of positive collaboration with the administration, and really making an effort to um, meet people, make those kind of contacts, um, do whatever kind of research support organizing that we can do to, to make these things happen, and we've been very successful with it. It's not always easy, but it's always positive, which I think is key. Um, in terms of, of our future work, um, at least as it pertains to food, Greeny Princeton is involved in sustainability issues kind of across the board, not just in food. But we'd really like to see, and, and um, Ruthie Swab, who's sitting um, back over there, is one of our um, undergraduates has been working very hard on getting an organic herb garden started here on campus. And uh, the idea being that we'll have something there, an interface for the students to sort of um, actually take part in, in producing some food, and those herbs will be used in the dining halls. Um, a much tougher proposition, something we, we sort of hoping for in the future, would be something more centrally located, um, a demonstration organic garden. Uh, we don't have any illusions that we're going to be able to provide food for the campus, but it would be nice to have something centrally located that people can see and use as an educational tool to, to talk about these issues that Katie will be um, exploring in her seminar next semester. But um, like I said, it's not always easy and uh, it's hard to find space and kind of get those things in the planning project. But those, and money, money funding is always an issue. But those are the, these are the kind of things that we're thinking about and uh, directions that we're moving. Thanks. Again, my name, can you hear me? Great. <laughs> My name is Anim Steele. I work at a nonprofit in Boston called The Food Project. Um, it's a, an organization whose vision is to create personal and social change through sustainable agriculture. And we do that in a number of ways. Um, we grow a quarter million pounds of, of, our, of sustainably grown produce on our farms right in the city of Boston and in the suburbs. We hire teenagers from different backgrounds, racial, ethnic, geographic, class backgrounds. Um, so that in the process of growing our food, we're also breaking down, breaking down those social barriers, which are pretty significant in Boston. Um, and we also coordinate a global network of, of youth, high school students, college students, grad students, uh, young people in their, in their early part of their career, um, who are food activists and emerging leaders. And that network and, and the work that we do in Boston is something that gives me a lot of hope. It's a very hopeful uh, community and network to be a part of. And so what I want to do with, with you is share really quickly um, some of the optimism I see, and in particular, um, what, uh, uh, what I'm seeing emerging as a great potential on college campuses uh, across the country. Um, 
So if you, if you step back from, from this room and from what's going on in Princeton, and you looked all across the country, what you'd see is, is what um, Katie referred to as a lot of activity on college campuses. And so far, I, I'm aware of roughly 300 um, efforts on college campuses across the country. And it could well be more. I'm, I'm in, including that number, um, things that, um, things like college farms, uh, boycotts against Taco Bell for to support farm worker rights, um, the farm to cafeteria efforts that are like the ones that are represented here. So there's, there's a lot in that, in that group. There's a lot of energy there. And if you step back even further, what, what you would see, uh, or what, what I've seen, is that there's $4 billion that universities and colleges spend on food. And in addition, there's 17 million students that, or over 17 million students that are, are being fed by those programs. And I look at those numbers, and I think that's an incredible, um, there's incredible potential there, and it, it points to the kind of system, systemic change that some people were talking about earlier in the day. Um, and so what I, what I want to do is just raise a couple issues about uh, what I think would turn that potential into, into something really s significant. How can, how can that potential become uh, actual uh, broad broad-based change? And there are three things that I see as, as really important at this stage of the social movement, um, which several people, Marion and Eric and other people, have referred to as emerging. They are to unify, to simplify, and to amplify. And I won't say a lot about each of them because I want to leave time for discussion. Also because I think when it comes to unifying, the kind of discussion that we're having here at this conference represents that, um, that uh, the need, especially early in a social movement, to figure out who's in the, who's in the choir and to make that choir as big as possible so that the movement isn't just a collection of parallel streams, but it's a, it's a, uh, a, a big river um, of change. So I, anyway, I see that happening here at Princeton already. That, that's, that's great. In some ways, I think that, that you're probably ahead of what I've seen at other campuses. In terms of simplifying, um, I'll just go back to, to what I've heard, what I heard Stu mention about um, the slashes. And what I, I think if you, if you listed all the concerns that we have about food in this room, you, you have a lot of slashes, right? And, and I've found that sometimes myself, when I'm, especially when I'm talking to other people who are um, not as familiar with this work, I'm, I'm, I'm having like label overload. Um, and, and, you know, it's organic, local, sustainably grown. Blah, blah, blah. So I, I have felt the need to reach for a, a unifying term, a simplifying term sometimes. And we've been, we've been talking recently at, at the organization about um, this kind of ethical food as, as real food. Uh, it's convenient in a way, uh, and it also has a, a deeper meaning. If you go to the dictionary and look up, look up each of those words, real and food, you'll find um, that food... Um, at least one definition of it is something that sustains uh, or supplies and nourishes, and that real um, means true, actual, not imaginary. So when we talk about real food, we're talking about food that is uh, that truly nourishes, uh, or a food system which truly nourishes the people, the people who eat, the, the earth, uh, the community, uh, and the producers. And anyway, I've just I offered that as, as another way to, to talk about, about ethical food. Um, there's something I, I might mention later if it, if it comes up in questions about um, what I see as a somewhat simplifying goal that comes out of the Kellogg Foundation's work and how they are conceiving in their, in their Food and Society initiative of, of, of how to frame a large scale, um, how to frame their goal about a large scale shift in the food system. But I'll leave that for the questions if it comes up. And then just lastly to say, to, to comment on what I mean about amplifying, um, I think it's, I, I think it's really important for everybody to recognize that, that students, the student voice is so important in, um, in, the, in promoting the kind of change we need on campus. And that recognition already seems to be here. And again, I think, I think to some degree you're, you can lead the way on that. And I would, I would encourage, encourage you to do the kind of, and all of us do the kind of things that, again, I see happening, which is to create more dialogue across campuses um, so that there's real strength in numbers, so that the food industry and dining services understands students' needs um, and, and desires um, as, as a whole in, in the nation. Um, and I think I will stop there and wait for questions. We have about 15 minutes for questions and answers, and I think we still have mic runners in the audience, and uh, then we'll have some closing comments. Any questions?
capacity um, of providing food for your people considered sprouts and sprouting, which can be done in, in small containers in a dorm room. It can be done in gardens. It can be done in major um, quantities to support the food service, especially the sunflower sprouts, buck, um, buckwheat sprouts, pea shoots, mung bean sprouts are extremely nutritious. They're organic when they're grown properly. They don't have to be cooked. They can be eaten in salads, and students can make them themselves. And there's no excuse not to have organic food. Okay. T to the gentleman who is in, um, in the position at the university, there is a university it's called the Maharishi University. It was renamed. It was Fairfield, Iowa. It was renamed Vedic City, Iowa. The campus produces its own produce and fruit and is 100% organic. All staff, all students, and all faculty always eat because it is the function of the university to promote the Ayurveda, which is 5,000 years old, and teaches the value of organic foods, freshly produced. If they don't eat the food, within 24 hours it gets thrown out. And I, I, I posit this to you as an example of a whole university campus that's totally organic, so you might want to investigate in Fairfield, Iowa, the university, and how they can do what they do. And they grow herbs, and they grow everything, and it's phenomenal. Right here in the front. I think it's so fantastic what I see happening on college campuses with sustainable foods. I work for the New York Coalition for Healthy School Lunches, which focuses on K through 12. And it is just such an uphill struggle there. In New York State, we're groveling for five cents additional money for fresh fruits and vegetables. And um, the food cost for lunches is approximately 90 cents. And what can you do with that? Um, and the uh, school administrators and school boards, associations are um, against legislation which would remove junk food from schools. And finally, the entrees are pretty much always meat and cheese based and pretty high in saturated fat and really unhealthy. So what I see on co co happening here and on other college campuses, I just wish, I mean, I'm working so hard in it every day, but wish that we could see this movement at the level um, at K through 12 because, you know, where kids are building their bodies and they are what they eat and, and it's just so bad. And so um, I just want to say as um, an action item for a movement towards more sustainable, more healthy food in the lower grades that we really have to advocate on the federal and state level for more funding for school foods because 90 cents for food costs for lunch, it's just a crime. It's really a crime. Anim? Anim? I was wondering if you have... I'm over here, Kathy. Oh, <laughs> I was just wondering... <laughs> I was wondering if you had any comment on what you all are doing um, that might impact that or have, having an impact in the Boston area? Uh, what we're doing on... Uh, about in, the... In trying to address the, the, lo the school issues, the health in the school... Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd actually first say that for someone who wants more detailed answers on that, that some of my colleagues are upstairs, some of whom I went to Princeton are working on those issues. In particular, Becky Nemec is there, and she's she's uh, starting to work with a coalition of groups in Boston on on a food policy council and examining what Boston public schools can do to source their food from from um, from all sorts of better sources than they come from right now. So it's an, it's an effort that's, that's um, it's happening in uh, more so in, in smaller school districts in western Massachusetts and other parts of the country. Um, this, is, this will be one of the, I think, bigger efforts in a, in a big school system, at least, in, at least in, certainly in Massachusetts. Thank you. I saw a question up here. A gentleman with his hand. what you said about uh, the quantity of food in the dining halls. Because while you were talking, uh, I was uh, thinking how I feel every time I walk into a dining hall here in Princeton where there is uh, this incredible amount of food. And I always think, uh, who is going to eat it? You know, how much is going to, to be wasted of all this food? 
And uh, uh, I think uh, that's where, you know, one should start, to educate the students and say that they could live very well with the eight or ten items, you know, at their disposal. I'm saying this because I spent, um, obviously I'm here at Princeton, I've uh, been here for a long time, but I spent a lot of time in Italy in universities and uh, 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 very often I eat in, uh, in uh, dining halls in Italy, in the universities with the students, and you only see eight, ten t items at the most. So the students are uh, served with some pasta, some meat, uh, two or three vegetables, uh, fruit, and if they want, a glass of wine, which... <laughs> which <laughs> which actually teaches them that wine enhances the food. Wine is not to get drunk, but you just enjoy the food you are eating. And so it's a matter really of educating students about all those things. And Kate, my student, knows exactly what I'm saying. She was, she was in, in our program, in our summer program, and she ate, I, I think, in the dining hall. And the American students very often say, uh, this is not a dining hall, this is a gourmet cafeteria. Have you, uh, just to ask, have you found that there's less food waste when you improve the dining hall with your sustainable food? Ideally, yes. So you, you think about streamlining the, num the, the, the amount of various product you're handling, the odds are you're going to be able to control better when you're forecasting or estimating how much food you need to prepare on a daily basis. The less that you're trying to figure out, the less amount of options you try to figure out, the, the better you're going to pinpoint it. Now, that's, that comes down to management skills and, and, and things like that. I just want to comment, Pietro, you know, you're talking, it, it may make common sense to some of us, but to other people, it scares them to death. You know, we're talking about going back in time to, you know, like a college, the, the makeup of a, of, a, of a campus menu 30 years ago, you know, as far as quantity goes. And, you know, when we were putting this plan into effect at Yale, before I'd ever done it before, I was scared to death about what, what is the reaction going to be. And thank God, because we got it right, that the, the, the quality of the food and the stories behind the food far exceeded people asking, where's my pizza, burgers, stir fry, you know, this station, that station, where's all my options? The, we, as Alice had said, you know, we seduced them with taste. But it's a big shift, and there's a lot of students here, and I ask you, you know, are you prepared for that, or are your friends prepared for that? Um, and I'm not saying you would do it in every dining hall or whatever. Again, that's that whole process of commitment or levels, but but it's a drastic commitment. I think John captures it correctly. And, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, like being in the business for 24 years and John 25, that when we started, a salad bar was innovative. And, you know, now look at where we are today. We have pizza stations and we have a variety of different stations. And part of our new model is that uh, we will have more foods cooked to order. So in general, you'll see a lot less waste. A lot of the pans that we call the cycle menu will go away. So you won't see a lot of those uh, foods. And, and it will ultimately reduce some of the waste. And the only thing I could say to you about the wine, Pietro, is chindan. Okay. <laughs> It's back here in the, right there. I appreciate the um, detail about the struggle you have to make changes w under the scope of cost containment that you both discussed um, earlier in the session. Uh, my perspective or question is about it from a bigger, from a bigger perspective, the, the kind of cheap food policy that institutions have to deal with, including the fact that, in general, academic institutions, healthcare institutions and others have to work under the lowest cost bid procedures for food acquisition and other approaches. Now, imagine if Princeton or any other university said, we're going to hire our faculty by the lowest bid instead of by the highest quality of faculty we can get, and we're going to have our facilities in the cheapest kind of, let's say, metal sheds we have instead of this beautiful room that we're in today. And instead of the beautiful grounds I was walking in all day today and last night, we're just going to let it go to weed. 
And yet when it comes to food, it's the lowest cost is always seems to be the bottom line. It's the price, it's the price, it's the price. Now, my parents' generation paid 25% of its income for food. Our generation pays less than 10%, and that's on average. I imagine if you looked at the percentage of the total budget of an institution over the last 25 or 40 years, it would similarly scale down to the same. I don't have that data. I don't even know if it exists, but I imagine it's similar to that of overall consumer spending. So my question is, how can we get institutions and others to get beyond this kind of cheapest price mentality about food and treat the food and the consequences of food with the same importance as we treat the quality of education that they want to provide and the institutional surroundings and setting that they want that to be provided in. If, 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 I, if I can, that might be a perfect segue into the, I mean, I think it's framing. We've got to reframe the perspective of, of the impact our food decisions are having on so much and so many. I got it. You know, I mean, it, to me, when I, my eyes were open, when I heard the stories and the impact and saw it and, and experienced it, I was very fortunate. But, uh, Anim, you mentioned the framing, the Kellogg, but, but I mean, there's a, there's a major uh, initiative that has to take place to really get people to, to understand where we're at. Is that a good segue into that? You want to? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to comment yeah, on that? There's, there's a Um, your question is the most important question, and people say a lot, oh, well, Yale had Alice Waters, and Alice is wonderful and has done a huge amount for us. At the end of the day, what's moved things at Yale is having the president's support and having students' support. Food in institutions has been shuttled aside and treated like maintenance, and it has to become part of the education. And to really shift what's happening at school so that Stu has the support he needs here, um, it takes people like Peter Singer, and it takes the president of the university to be behind it. Um, that's what, what moves things at universities. Uh, it's both the president and the students, and we need to bring them into the conversation. If I could chime in, too, I think that... I think that, um, you know, we have broad support in the student body for, for all the kind of things that we're doing, but we do have trouble motivating people to really get actively involved, and that's always been a challenge that we faced as student organizers, is getting people to sort of take that time and, and, and apply that energy to do that. And so, yeah, it's one of those things we have to sort of always think about when we're strategizing for sort of the next moves. Whereas maybe where educating people to ask for those options is what we need to start to motivate people beyond this Princeton apathy of being a student. The thing that strikes me is that um, Princeton's endowment must be, what, 12 or $15 billion, the, the, the $10 billion? It's a lot. And the, uh, the, the $5, billion, $5 million food budget sounds uh, like a pretty small number, which if you were going to increase it by 10 or 15% or whatever it would be to allow you to have your choice in purchasing local food, certainly it's not going to uh, bankrupt the university. I tend to agree, and we've been working with mirrors for years, uh, and uh, we were fortunate that a lot of the changes that uh, that we made, the, the two organic cereals, the organic greens in every salad bar, um, the cage-free eggs, the fair trade coffee, those cost more. But we made those decisions within our own budget. Uh, but there is a point where you can't go beyond. Uh, we can find efficiencies, we can trim labor, and whatever we find, when we find excess, we actually sit down with our students and we prioritize. And that's one of the reasons why, okay, we have $2,000 to spend, so bread was an easy one. We call it the low-hanging fruit, and we, we make those decisions, we move on. But uh, at some point, you're, we're all right. I mean, we need to look at uh, systemically saying we need to put some extra funding into the program if we're going to move to the next level. Thank you for your question. Um, I believe up in the balcony. Hello? Great. I'm a... Uh... I'm a Princeton alum, and one of the things that I was really excited about, um, because I work on a lot of these issues, to be able to come back to Princeton and see how much energy there is around these issues here. And one of the things I'm most curious about is um, how can we best capitalize on this as a university issue and tie some of the food choices that we're making in so far in the 
dining services into some of the curriculum. And I was really excited to hear about the seminar. And I'm wondering, are there other efforts looking forward that are going to, especially here with so much pressure, um, not pressure, so much opportunity to do thesis that are a lot of student-initiated work? Are you guys seeing a lot of student-initiated work sort of doing some of the background research on this stuff? And how could we best encourage that? Well, I would say not yet, but I haven't written my thesis. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I think especially, I mean, we're meeting with you guys tomorrow, and we're really excited about that. And I think hopefully that will open up some of the opportunities. And I know there's a High Meadows Fellowships, I think, with the Food Project, um, which seems like a great partnership. Um, but any, anything you can suggest would probably be the best. And anything you plan I, I mean, I think that I know that, like, in the intro to environmental studies and stuff like that, these issues do come up as part of the sort of general curriculum. It's probably not, it's not enough, and I think more, like, dedicated courses would be good. In terms of student-initiated research, I think that that's, that's an opportunity where um, I would like to see more outreach to other professors of things who can actually actively encourage their students to do um, and, you know, independent and original research in, in these kind of issues. And I think that that can be applied across the board from undergraduate theses um, to graduate stuff. So, yeah. Katie, Katie mentioned a meeting which is happening tomorrow, which maybe yeah. some people who are uh, here who don't know about it might want to know about it. Um, Greening, Greening Princeton and, and um, some of the alums from Princeton who are in the food project uh, and myself and others are going to be talking about uh, more about next steps at the Princeton campus and how that may, re may relate to uh, the movement that's happening at campuses across the across the country. And that's going to be at 9.30 tomorrow morning um, in Five, five Ivy. Ivy. Five Ivy? Five Ivy? Okay. Um, down here in front, in the red sweater. Thanks. Hi, Katie. I just wanted to applaud your efforts to um, raise awareness on the campus and get this new course started. One suggestion I had is that you might want to involve students who are uh, pre-medical students. Um, I'm trained as a physician, and I did not learn anything about the public health effects of our food production system until well after I graduated medical school. And I think that if you were to involve pre-medical students or students involved in the allied health professions, that might be a, a good population to tap into. Thank you. That's obvious. This woman in blue, I think we have time for after the woman in blue there with her hand raised. Um, we have time for one more question. Hi. Um, I come from Wisconsin. I uh, flew in just for this and also to see my grade school friend. But I want to tell you that I'm a wellness consultant and I work at the Medical College of Wisconsin. And I travel to corporations to develop wellness programs in them. The only way the programs get established is if the upper management believe in what I'm doing. The only way to convince them is A, they know somebody with cancer, <laughs> or uh, B, there's a return on investment. It's all about the bottom dollar. Now, there's an organization called the Wellness Council of America, WellCoa, okay? They have a plan that's been established to spread wellness programs across America. My question to you is twofold. The first thing is, is there a program out there that is established for someone like me who wants to bring this to the Milwaukee, uh, Medical College of Wisconsin in Milwaukee, Wisconsin? There are other colleges that want to do this, and if a plan is established similar to a wellness program in corporate America, it spreads like wildfire. And when people realize that health is important, of course, nutrients that come from the foods strongly influence cancer prevention and cardiovascular disease. So my, my question is first, is there a plan out there? And second, are you willing to create one to spread the national and also worldwide plan of ac action. What, what you're saying to me is, is very interesting, and I think along the lines of, of what we're seeing as is needed. Um, first, let me say that that. Can I just interject one thing? I just excuse me. I, I don't. I just want to challenge you to collect data. That was the only way wellness has spread like wildfire in the U.S. So if you can, you know, see how much the cost is being saved by going local 
and collect data on it right here in Princeton, you will be able to challenge the rest of the nation as well as upper management. I so agree with you. I think, I think what, part of what needs to happen is that we need to make spaces where, um, and I'm, I focus on young people and students. I don't mean to exclude faculty administrators. That's just, that's just my focus. So please, uh, that's, that's what I tend to speak to, is especially for, for students to be in spaces where um, that wildfire can, can spread. And so if you or other, other young students you know are interested in um, being a part of the, uh, we have a national emerging leadership program called the CADRE. Um, uh, CADRE meaning an, uh, a, a group of trained individuals around which a, a movement or organization can be formed. Um, we also have spaces at, at some of the national conferences um, for young people to get together. And, I, and what I would like to see happen, what we'd like to see happen, the Food Project, is for more communication and more collective uh, sharing of best best practices, strategies, data, and a collective voice so, um, so that those in power really hear this very, very strongly. Um, well, so one of the reasons that. these food programs are so important in places like Princeton is because Princeton graduates people who will be running those corporations. So yeah. it may be a matter of time. When I was here 25 years ago, food really wasn't discussed, really, only, only but to, to complain about it because the food was horrible. There were no food issues. Things have changed. But it's going to take a while for that to percolate into the, the business world. I think we're going to have to um, close here and thank the panel for their comments and the audience for their questions. And um, Peter, would you like to thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Kathy. Thank you very much, all of the members of the panel. Um, we've had a, uh, a long day, but I think it's been a very uh, full one, full of different perspectives and information. And, and in fact, I think that's been true of, of the whole events. If we, those of you who were here last night heard Eric Schlosser start us off with uh, uh, some historical uh, information on the development of fast food, how we got to be the fast food nation, and how also there are those alternative ideas that sprang up. <clears throat> and I think he situated it well in a political structure, in the structure of large corporations with a lot of influence on politics and focused on that as something that we really need to think about in terms of ultimately lying behind some of the influences in our food supply. And then when uh, Marian Nessel started this morning, she also, I think, showed that although you can talk about consumer choice and, and individual responsibility, those choices are framed um, by, for example, the way the supermarket is structured and uh, the way you walk around, the things that are offered to you, the things that tempt you, and the serving sizes that you're offered, which um, while people may think that they are just independently making their free choices, if you look at it across a range, you see that um, the, the, it's the environment that has the influence and we really somehow need to get to grips with that and control that environment. <clears throat> Gary Nabhan talked about uh, the sense of place that you get when you try and source your food locally and produce that locally and the various uh, ethical and environmental benefits of that and gave us, I think, uh, perhaps more than anyone else in, in the, the conference, a kind of poetical perspective on some of those uh, choices that you make, which I think gave us all things to think about. When we uh, got to looking at some of the specifics about uh, the environmental and animal welfare impacts of our food choices, uh, Becky Goldberg, I think, reminded us of, of the importance of the fish choices we make and the seafood choices, which are sometimes things that people don't think about. They think, um, oh, well, I'm, you know, I eat fish. A lot of people tell me I don't eat meat, but I eat fish, um, as if that solves all the ethical dilemmas. Obviously, it, it doesn't, both from the point of view of the welfare of, of fish, but also from the environmental perspectives. There's a lot more to be said about that and a lot we have to be careful about. Gidden Eschel and, and Pamela Martin, I think, showed us some of the really interesting research about the uh, environmental impacts uh, of the food choices that we make, and I think will have surprised a lot of people because we do tend to think about, for example, the choice of the car we drive as the most important 
choice we make in terms of greenhouse gases. But uh, the punchline of what uh, they have researched is that perhaps the dietary choices we make are even more important than that uh, for greenhouse gases and, of course, for a lot of other environmental impacts as well, including those things like uh, nitrogen runoff and use. And then after lunch, I think we had a, a, a fascinating session uh, with two very different speakers from very different perspectives um, that nevertheless worked together really well. I think Michael Pollan showed us uh, that some of these choices are more complex than we think, that you've got to get beyond uh, simple, simple shorthand slogans and labels, beyond some of that polemics, and really look at in a little bit more detail what those issues are. And uh, we also got, I think, into some of the more interesting philosophical uh, issues about how you consider the ethics of choices you make regarding animals um, and uh, whether you think of them as individuals, as that being crucial, or take a, an evolutionary perspective, if indeed that is a, a, a basis from which you can take an ethical perspective, which obviously is a, a big issue that philosophers have talked about under the label of, of the move from is to ought or sometimes called the naturalistic fallacy and we would need to discuss those things a lot more I think to get to the bottom of that and also the question that came over here about can you consider the interests of a non-existent being um, certainly would get us into a lot more philosophy if we wanted to go there and uh, that would be a whole other conference I think that we could have. Uh, then we had Bell Blangert who um, I, I do think um, you know, really was here in knowing that this audience was not one that was going to be particularly sympathetic to the corporation that he represents, but um, did come and, and give us his point of view. I think that always takes courage. It's sometimes easy just to say, no, I've got too many other commitments. And I'm glad that he got a, a respectful hearing and that we listened to what he had to say, uh, whether or not we were actually convinced by it. But... Um, <laughs> There are some hopeful signs of the things that he's um, thinking about and, and some, I think, frank admissions of things that he would like to do, and perhaps it's up to us to keep pushing McDonald's and other uh, corporations like that to really make changes. How far it's possible for them to change is, of course, a, a good question, but um, some changes, uh, perhaps some small changes they have made, some other ones they can still make, and as long as we have that structure, until we can make the further changes that Eric Schlosser talked about uh, to the corporate structure of this country, I think we still have to try and do what we can to push with the corporations as they are um, and to get a little bit more out of them in terms of the environment, in terms of animals. And also, of course, perhaps we didn't discuss it enough with Bob Langett, um, the things that Eric Schlosser talked about in terms of, of labour, in terms of the workers' rights and workers' status, which is um, also a big issue in this area. Well, then in this last session, of course, we, we got down, if you like, to the, the nitty-gritty of, of how do you change an institution. And it was great to have John Turenne, who's played such a role in, in changing uh, Yale's food and working with other, um, other institutions too now, and uh, have Stu Orifice uh, come along and talk to us about the things, the steps that have been taken and the further steps that, that can be taken. And I hope that we can uh, take more steps. I mean, I think the discussion showed there's a lot of different things that come together. Um, there is the student, student request, student demand. There is also the question of, of money, um, as John Turenne showed, and we have to ask, where does that come from? Uh, if they've done certain things within the Princeton Dining Services budget, can we increase that budget? Can we increase it? I mean, we have, Princeton has, uh, uh, as was said, an ample endowment. We could use more of that endowment if the trustees consent. Um, trustees, incidentally, are meeting at the university right now um, and over this weekend, and we invited them to come along. I don't know whether any were able to. They do have, of course, uh, a full program of their own. And since someone mentioned getting the president of the university involved, I think the uh, lady from, from Yale, uh, we did invite Shirley Tillman to come along, um, but of course it, is, it was an unfortunate coincidence that we didn't know when we started booking up the speakers for this that um, she was involved with the trustees meeting. But we will certainly talk to her um, about this in the wake of this and, and try to involve her uh, and uh, the trustees of the university in terms of, of making that change. And of course it could also be another thing that the development office could work with because you know we have 
a, a, a development office that's very active in, in getting people to support the university. Um, we get very large donations for things, sometimes, for example, for things that uh, involve building new buildings, which are important. But um, if we could get uh, donations for building a more ethical food program, I think that that would be also a valuable thing to do. So it was great to have that, that panel and, and all of the contributors to the panel for that final discussion. Now, um, I'm not quite the last word of this uh, conference. Uh, Steve Pakala, who's the director of the Princeton Environmental Institute, is going to speak after me. Oh, and then just in case you don't know, there is uh, a reception in uh, the atrium at, at GEO, at the building where the Princeton Environmental Institute is housed, which for those of you who haven't, haven't been there, you get to see a, a wonderful dinosaur uh, skeleton as well. Um, for, so uh, it's, a, it's an interesting space. So I hope many of you will come down and join us for a closing uh, reception and wind down after that. Oh, and the bonfire, I guess, will be out the back as well somewhere. Yes, right. Um, <laughs> So um, Steve is going to, um, I think, thank uh, the, the staff of PEI who have done a fantastic job. I want to add my voice uh, uh, to uh, organizing this, this conference and have made um, it, it really a pleasure to be part of. And uh, I do want to thank them. I want to thank, of course, the people from uh, Richardson Auditorium, Alexander Hall, who've done a, a wonderful job also with uh, making sure that everything works. Uh, that uh, the PowerPoints and, and the water and, and the mics and all that's provided and given us this great space. Um, thank the, uh, the video crew who's recording this and it uh, will be on, online uh, once we, we get it up so you can recommend it to friends to look at um, I, on the Princeton University website. I want to thank um, Andrea Sunmi Jones, who is someone who has worked with me on previous conferences, helping to organize things, and she's been responsible for looking after some of the aspects of the administration that weren't done in-house with PEI, including the, uh, the poster for uh, last night's event, which I think was an artistic highlight, and um, uh, a number of other things as well. So thanks, Andrea, for that. And if, uh, I, of course, I want to thank all of the speakers uh, who have come, and uh, many of whom have stayed right through uh, the event. Um, without you, we wouldn't have had an event. It was, it was really something where it was like uh, uh, all the, a constellation where all the stars lined up, one of those uh, rare astronomical moments where everybody that I asked, um, some of them hummed and hawed and went sure whether they could make the commitment at the time, but in the end, it all clicked into place, and we got all of the people that I really wanted to get together uh, to speak to this event, uh, as well, of course, as, as the local Princeton people. So I want to thank you all very much for making everything possible. And uh, thank you. And of course, finally, I know Steve is going to do this too, but I want to thank Bert Kerstetter as well for, uh, for his contribution to this. Steve, over to you. Thank you. One of the advantages of being part of an organization like PEI is that you, you, you get to go to events like this and to, to see new things and learn about an issue that, that confronts us all and about which, at least before the last couple of days, I, I knew very little. So thank you all for attending and for uh, having the same sort of interest as I do in, in, in this subject now. The, the disadvantage of being uh, part of an organization like PEI is that so often when you come away from a, from a conference, you're, you're depressed because the problems that confront us are so, are so vast, so intractable, you know, that, that it's going to take such originality of thought to get through them. Uh, it's, it's going to take so much energy because they're global in reach. It's going to take such fantastic organizational capacity. It's going to require so much generosity because, you know, we have to manage a global commons. But in, in this case, more than just about any other I can remember, uh, I, I, I see glimmers of hope in, in, in unlikely places close to home. For, first of all, for generosity, I think that we need to look to the example of Bert Kerstetter, whose, whose philanthropy... Um, made, made this possible. And I want to thank Bert for that. Our list of, of debts to, to Bert grows ever longer. Um, also, incidentally, we can also, I think, 
look to Bert for, for uh, energy. What, what, what I suggest we do is to ask him what he eats and then eat the same thing. If you don't know what I'm talking about, talk to him for a few minutes and you will. All right. For originality, I think we need to only look at, at the example of Peter Singer. No one else in the university community that I know of could have pulled this off. To, <laughs> nobody else has the chutzpah, the, the breadth of contacts, the, the probity, the, the, the depth of vision, all of the things necessary to bring the, the combination of things to this, to this subject that it deserves. And finally, to, to deal with the immensity of this global problem, to deal with the administrative challenge, I thought, well, that's probably the toughest one. But then I thought, you know, why don't we just do at PEI what we always do, mention it to Kathy Hackett, wait for the whirlwind to be created, and then sneak off to the lab to do research, all right? <laughs> this is really her event. All right, she pulled this off, she did the work, she's got the well-oiled staff going. We have to thank the staff as well. They've worked extraordinarily hard at this. Thank you, Kathy. And finally, I'd like to close by just thanking all of you for taking the time, for having the curiosity, for having the commitment, for having the soul to come to this event. We're also in your debt. Thank you.